So, but well, we can do a little. We can. Okay. Um, I was waiting for a few more people to come in. It's now live streaming on YouTube for every, everyone who's already in the meeting. Okay. So hi everyone, hope you have um, joined the Zoom properly. Um, just a disclaimer that this is going live on YouTube. So if you don't, if you're not comfortable with your face being on YouTube, then um, just turn off your camera. And for the sake of um, the talk, please keep your microphones off um, during the duration of the talk. And we'll have a QA and a at the end where you can either put your questions in the chat or um, raise your hand and then we'll call on you and you can ask um, the professor like whatever question that you have. Mm -hmm. um, just to introduce the event, this is the second day of Varsity Sci. This is the first time uh, the Physics Societies of Oxford and Cambridge are getting involved, coming together. So um, we're starting off with an amazing keynote speaker. Following that, we'll have uh, a series of talks by student speakers. So do join for that event as well. And um, Daphne, if you want to introduce the keynote. Yes, so um, our keynote speaker today is um, Professor James Binney, who is an astrophysicist, and he's a professor of physics at the University of Oxford. Um, he's also former head of the Department of Theoretical Physics and an Emeritus Fellow of Merton College. And a few awards and prizes um, he's received the Maxwell Prize Award of, of the Institute of Physics in 1986, the Brewer Award of the American Astronomical Society in 2003, the Dirac Medal in 2010, and the Eddington Medal in 2013. And he has been a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society since 1973. Um, so now that we have introduced our amazing speaker, and we're proud to have him in our University, should we start the? Oh, okay. A few other people are muted, so we can start the talk. Yeah, I'll just be admitting people as we go along. So. Cool. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, I'll stop sharing. So, Professor James, you can mm -hmm. share screen. Um. Oh, at the moment, oh dear, I've got. Um, I should minimize this one, perhaps. How about that? Right. Can everybody see uh, my title page, which just says resonances? Uh, I don't think so. I can't see anything. You can't see anything. Oh, dear. Right. Um, 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 possibly try sharing again. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah right. Okay. So, yeah. oh, no. Um, I back out of this. Um, escape isn't doing anything. Oh, it was working so well before. Um, it has froze. Um, the frustrating thing is I can see uh, Alma, but in the corner, but otherwise I can just see my title page covering the entire screen with no possibility of um, escape. Yeah, maybe escape was. Well, I tried escape, control will delete. That did something. Okay. So, um, task manager, let's try this. Um, can't now find a task associated with. Meetings. Okay, so uh, I think perhaps um, what's causing the trouble? Right. Um, Microsoft PowerPoint. Let's kill that. End task. Right. It has gone away. Um, uh, 
and I can see Zoom, um, return to meeting. You're all there now. Um, okay, so now I think I better get my presentation back. Sorry for this, folks. Um, no worries. No, that's fine. Right, okay. PowerPoint is loading. Um, right, the right thing is here. Now let's switch on slideshow. No, oh, 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 that was a mistake, sorry, because when you switch on slideshow, you lose capacity to do anything else. Yeah, just uh, um, start the meeting. <laughs> now share screen. Yeah. Right, so share screen. Uh, can people now see resonances? Yes. Yes, yes, we can. Right, okay, <laughs> we're nearly, so we're nearly there. Do I dare? Um, uh, yeah, start slideshow now. You, you see everything that you need to see. All right, fine, we'll go. We'll, we'll go. So um, here, here, is, uh, here is my outline. Um, I'm going to start with a, re with a review of sort of basic first year physics um, about driven harmonic oscillators, which I'm sure everybody is pretty familiar with. Um, but then I will use that to talk about quantum mechanics, resonances in quantum mechanics, because um, there's a huge amount of nonsense in quantum mechanics that a lot of quantum mechanics is really about resonant interactions between weakly coupled systems. And I want to make that, make that clear. And then I want to talk about resonances in galactic dynamics, which of course is really my own field, um, where a very important extra feature, we, we see the same uh, sort of, some of the same phenomena that we see in quantum mechanics, but um, with nonlinearity playing an important role. And I'll talk just rather sketchily then about two interesting topics. One is waves, stellar waves, waves in galactic disks, um, which is very much a current topic of research, and also about the influence of resonances on the evolution of stellar systems, sorry, of planetary systems, and in particular, the enormous um, impact that general relativity turns out to have on the stability of the solar system. So, so could I possibly stop the slideshow so make it full screen? Oh, you oh right, okay. You would like to have it full screen, right? Yes. That was, that Thank was you. what that is what did it um, unhinged it. <laughs> so, so we're already we're already like that. Sorry, what I need to do is this one here. This yes. is this was the dangerous button, all right? Okay, you, thank it, you, perfect. That, that's that's working all right, right? Driven yes. harmonic oscillator. Yep. Perfect. So, thank you, Raj. Um and I will minimize the people, I think. Right. So <clears throat> the equation of motion of the driven harmonic oscillator is in the top right hand corner. Um, and probably will be familiar to everybody. When you drive this thing at a frequency omega, which is not its natural frequency, omega naught, um, you very quickly, by putting in the trial solution, the real part of A to the I omega t, come to the conclusion that there's a steady state solution. Uh, given here, x is uh, some multiple of cos omega t with a one minus omega squared over omega naught squared on the bottom. Um, so there is this steady state solution. <clears throat> In this solution, there is a 90 degree phase difference between the force, which goes like cos omega t, and the velocity, which goes like, of course, minus sine omega t. Uh, and that phase difference means that there's no net working. The force doesn't do any work averaged over a cycle, but in part of the cycle it puts energy in, in another part of the cycle it takes energy out, and that's how we have come to have a, a steady state solution. Um, but there is, a, there is a curious prediction, which is that the response of the system diverges as you approach the natural frequency. So the graph on the right shows the amplitude of the response uh, divided by some uh, dimensionally appropriate combination of the force and the mass and the frequency um, uh, as a function of the ratio of the frequency 
that which you drive it omega to the natural frequency omega naught and of course the response goes up to plus infinity and then comes whoosh back down to minus infinity um, as you cross over the natural frequency. So if you are, uh, oh, so you don't, you, uh, <clears throat> if, so the question now arises, so what happens if you actually drive it at the natural frequency? Then there isn't a steady state solution, but you can find the actual solution. This is, as I say, a very standard piece of first year physics. Um, by putting in the trial solution, not e to the i omega t, but e, t times e to the i omega t, uh, and you find the solution then is looking like cos, well, it's looking like sine omega naught t, uh, okay, cos omega naught t minus phase difference of pi upon two, but with a, an amplitude which grows linearly in time. So the graph at the bottom right is showing precisely this um, sinusoid um, which has an amplitude which is growing linearly as a function of time. So two things have happened by going at the, uh, by driving it at the natural frequency. First, we don't have a steady state solution. Second, we have a phase difference uh, of pi by two from what we had before. And third, sorry, we have that the time, that the amplitude is a linear function of time. And this shift in the phase by 90 degrees of the response, this pi by two is profoundly important because this means that now the, um, the force and the velocity are in phase. They are both going like cos omega t because the response x is going like sine omega t. So the, so the velocity is going like uh, cos omega t. And so the, the force is now working. And in fact, it's working at a rate which increases linearly in time. So if you actually work out what the force F cos omega naught T times the velocity X dot is, you get a slightly complicated expression because you, well, you get two terms because uh, when you differentiate T cos omega T, you get two terms. But the important term, the term that, that, that does everything um, is the, um, sorry, that should have been a T cos squared omega naught T. Uh, so, so the, energy of the system, um, when you integrate up this work rate of working, uh, grows like T squared. In fact, it's the product of F and T all squared. Okay, um, so let's talk about the impact of resonances in, quantitative, in quantum mechanics. Uh, and the obvious, the, the really, really important uh, application here is radiative transition, transitions. That's to say when an atom moves from one stationary state to another stationary state by emitting or absorbing a photon. And you work this out by taking the electromagnetic vector potential A to um, be proportional to the real part of E to the I omega T. Um, quantum mechanics says that an atom is a set of driven harmonic oscillators. Well, then an atom becomes a set of driven harmonic oscillators. It's, and a single atom is many harmonic oscillators um, because it has many natural frequencies. In fact, it has natural frequencies which are given by the energy difference between any two stationary states divided by H bar. And if any one, if the frequency which you're driving the atom with your electromagnetic wave, omega, coincides with any one of these natural frequencies, omega naught, you have a resonant interaction. Now, when you're in a stationary state, a state noted by, you know, this, this direct thing, Ej, so when you're in the J stationary state of the atom, it, the charge density, which quantum mechanics tells you how to work out, is time independent. So of course the atom doesn't radiate. But in a state of ill-determined energy, in a mixed state, if, you, if the state of the atom is a linear combination uh, of Ej and Ek of two states of well-defined energy, and therefore the atom itself does not have a well-defined energy, then the charge density of the atom oscillates at a frequency of the frequency given by the difference between the energies of those two stationary states. Um, and of course, an oscillating charge distribution is going to radiate electromagnetic radiation or alternatively absorb electromagnetic radiation, depending on um, what the radiation field is looking, what the, what the electromagnetic field in its neighborhood is looking like. 
but atoms are too small to radiate or absorb efficiently. Um, <laughs> they are about 10,000 times smaller than the, than the wavelengths of the, of the radiation that they might emit or absorb. Right, an atom has a dimension uh, which is about a tenth of a nanometer, and they they're all set up to absorb or emit radiation that has wavelengths of um, about a of, of, about a, of about a thousand nanometers. So they're in, so they're incredibly inefficient radiators. Right, to be a good radiator, electromagnetic radiation, your Dimensions need to be on the order of half a wavelength of the, of the radiation you're emitting or absorbing. So, uh, so this makes atoms very weakly coupled to the electromagnetic radiation field that's in which they're surrounded or embedded. And so a significant energy transfer is possible between the atom and the field uh, only if the two, two items remain in phase over many cycles. Um, if they remain in phase of many cycles, so sorry, this is a point I didn't quite make properly before, but you you saw that um, uh, when you drove a harmonic oscillator at its natural frequency, um, there was a precise frequency. There was a precise um, uh, that that. that there was a, there was a net absorption of energy because the driving force and the response had a, had a constant phase relationship to each other and that phase relationship was that that the velocity and the force were in phase so in order to get um, a significant because the coupling between the atom and the radiation field is very weak uh, it has to operate for a long time in order to transfer a significant amount of energy. And that transfer has to be always in the same direction, either from the electromagnetic field to the atom in the case of absorption, or from the atom to the electromagnetic field in the case of emission, if uh, we're to get a net transfer of energy. So the, the transfer of energy occurs only when the two are very closely al aligned in frequency. So the energy transfer is only happens when we have a good, when we have a very, we're very nearly on resonance, when omega is extremely close to omega naught. And that's why atoms have well-defined spectral lines um, and photons have well-defined frequencies. The photons that they emit have well-defined frequencies. So in this, in sort of the standard law of quantum mechanics, people say that the wave function of psi when you make a measurement collapses from um oh dear uh it collapses from ej to ek uh instantly right there's this fiction that there is an instantaneous collapse of the wave function on making a measurement from the state ej in which it was before you made the energy of the measurement to the state ek that it is after you've made the measurement in fact the transition from EJ to EK takes many cycles. So an easily worked out example of this is the Lyman alpha transition in hydrogen. So that's the transition in a hydrogen atom from uh, the N equals two principal quantum number two state to the principal quantum number one state. And you can work this all out analytically precisely. And it turns out that it takes about 10 million cycles um, of the oscillation for the um, um, for the energy to be uh, um, to be given up um, for the decay to occur it's, it's not remotely uh, instantaneous it is in it, quantum mechanics says that it's in fact a very long drawn out process and of course it is precisely because it is this very long drawn out process um, that the that the light that is given out, the Lyman alpha photons that are given out have a well-defined uh, frequency and you get a narrow spectral line. And the Lyman alpha transition is one of the fastest atomic transitions. The, another very important uh, transition in hydrogen is the hyperfine line at 21 centimeters as the, as the spin of the electron and the proton align one with the other, um, move from being parallel to antiparallel or vice versa. Uh, and this transition, which effectively only, which is a very important 
uh, astronomical tool in interstellar space, this transition uh, takes on the order of a million years to occur. So um, what's happening here is that as the amplitude AJ that the atom is in the state EJ, the stationary state EJ diminishes, and there's a corresponding growth in the amplitude uh, AK for the atom to be in the uh, EK stationary state, the charge distribution oscillates at this frequency omega naught and shakes the electromagnetic field um, launching a wave. Um, the field and the charge distribution stay in phase for millions of cycles, or they need to stay in phase for millions of cycles for the um, several electron volts of energy to be given up, to be transferred to the wave. Uh, and that's this requirement that they remain in phase for millions of cycles makes the, makes the transition a very uh, frequency specific process. Only radiation of precisely the right frequency or very narrow, extremely close to the correct frequency is going to affect this change. So let's now talk about the photoelectric effect, another classic um, topic from introductory quantum mechanics courses. And the, just to remind you what this effect is, if you expose a clean metal surface to monochromatic light, to a monochromatic source of light, if the frequency of this light source is below a critical frequency, omega naught, nothing happens, no matter how bright you make the light. If you raise the frequency of the light source uh, above this critical frequency, then you will find you'll be able to detect electrons being ejected by the light from the metal, no matter how faint you make the light source. So if you make the light source fainter and fainter, it, you get fewer and fewer electrons, but you go on getting electrons. Uh, and in fact, the ejection rate of the electrons is, is proportional to the intensity of the light, which from the point of view of electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic theory means it's proportional to the intensity, to the square, the mod square of the oscillating electromagnetic vector potential A. So, in, from the perspective of, of, of quantum mechanics, what is this? In a mixed state, so if we say that the state of an electron is an amplitude AB to be in a bound state, uh, to be tied within the metal, and an amplitude A free to be a free electron, which will, just to keep everything simple, assume means an electron which has negligible kinetic energy, so it has negligible energy, full stop then the charge density in the metal associated with this, this electron, which is in a state, in a state of ill-defined energy, um, has an amplitude to be, to, have, to be in two states of different energy, uh, has a charge density which oscill oscillates um, like cosine uh, Eb, the binding energy times T upon H bar. So it reson resonantly interacts with light, which has this same frequency. Um, now, the number of electrons with um, binding energy Eb decreases very strongly uh, as Eb drops below the Fermi energy. So on the right, there's a graph. I hope you can see it. It's rather obscured in my view by um, the um, um, by the zoom things. But what we see, what I've plotted here is the energy uh, over Kt the number of the, 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 the probability that the state, stationary state in the metal is uh, occupied, um, this probability is being plotted against the energy of that state. If the, um, um, if the uh, state has a sufficiently low energy, so back at minus 35 or something, um, units in uh, in units of kT, um, then the probability of occupation is one. All these states are bang full. But as the energy goes up to an energy that's called the Fermi energy, E Fermi, which is here taken to be 20 units of kT, 20 units of kT, um, the population level plummets. This is the standard Fermi distribution, uh, probability distribution with respect to energy. So there are very, very, uh, and in, a, in an ordinary metal, E over KT is actually much bigger uh, 
uh, than merely um, minus 20. You know, it's, it's, sorry, it's, it's a numerically bigger number, so it's minus something larger, and that makes this drop off even sharper. So there are essentially no electrons which have uh, an energy. So the binding energy is, is the distance from uh, any point in this graph to naught. So if EB is smaller than, than um, the Fermi energy, the number of electrons is falling very steeply and there's virtually no electrons. Whereas when EB is, um, is, is, is bigger than, um, than the Fermi energy, <coughs> then there are, there, there are loads of electrons. So <coughs> this resonant interaction, well, so if, if, you, if, the, if your light source has a, uh, has a frequency which radiate, which uh, sorry, has a frequency which would resonantly interact only with electrons uh, which have an energy bigger than the Fermi energy, you're not going to get a significant number of electrons ejected. And if your light source has a frequency, a bigger frequency, a higher frequency, which interacts with uh, uh, electrons which have energies, resonantly interacts with energies less than the Fermi energy, then you're going to get loads of electrons. And that's, that's basically what's happening. The time taken to transfer the energy, EB, out of the wave goes like one over the amplitude of the wave. We know that because we looked at the, uh, we integrated the rate of working of a resonant interaction um, right in the second slide. And we found that the energy transferred in time T was FT all squared over eight times the mass. So F in this case, that's the magnitude of the force is proportional to A. So if you want to transfer a fixed amount of energy E, um, uh, then the time you have to wait and you're using, you're using a force which is proportional to A, then the, the product A, the electromagnetic vector potential times T has to achieve a, a certain number, essentially 8M times the energy. Well, the, the units here are neither here nor there. So the, so the point is that the product AT is a constant. If you wind down A, if you make your light source weaker, then you have to wait longer in order to transfer the energy um, so that the product AT is definite. So, um, <coughs> so uh, the time taken to do the transfer goes like one over A um, and the range of frequencies, you, you also have to remain in phase for, so you have to remain in phase for a, for a time T, which means your frequency tolerance, the range of frequencies which are effectively resonantly interacting uh, gets smaller, um, well, it, it goes like one over T. So as you make A smaller and therefore T bigger, the frequency tolerance becomes smaller. And that's why the rate of ejection goes like A squared. So you see, that the, the, the photoelectric effect is also very naturally accounted for. I mean, is, is a real manifestation of resonant interaction plus the, um, the, the distribution of electrons within a metal. So now let me turn to um, resonances in galactic dynamics. So uh, ordinary Newtonian dynamics tells us that stars are three dimensional oscillators. They go around the galactic center um, the picture at the top right is actually showing uh, it has um, a planetary system. So it, it has a planet going around uh, on an epicycle, an elliptical epicycle, um, as it orbits around the sun on a, on a circular guiding center orbit. But, but the, same, the same dynamics, of course, uh, applies to a star like the sun. Uh, the planet could be uh, uh, a star moving around the galactic center which is where the, which, which would be where the sun is marked. So um, stars are three-dimensional uh, harmonic, sorry, not harmonic oscillators, three-dimensional oscillators. They, they go around the galactic center at a frequency which we can call capital omega. They oscillate in and out, that's to say, and also uh, wobble side to side. So that elliptical orbit is taking place at a frequency uh, omega has a period two, sorry, a frequency kappa has a period two pi over kappa. And they oscillate above and below the galactic plane 
at a frequency that we will call nu. The picture at the bottom is showing a typical orbit of a of a um, of a of a particle, um, a star maybe, um, in the meridional plane. That's the plane given by cylindrical radius r and distance from the galactic plane z. So that sort of pincushiony thing. It's oscillating in and out uh, radially at this frequency kappa, and it's oscillating up and down at a different frequency nu. Now, in a Kepler potential, all these three frequencies, omega, kappa, and nu, coincide. It's a very special feature of the, of the Kepler potential, the potential generated by a point mass or a point charge. But in a galaxy, all three frequencies are different. And in fact, even in the solar system, um, all three frequencies are strictly speaking different um, because they would be the same if if A, there was no general relativity, and B, so if Newton's theory was right, not Einstein's theory, and B, if um, the planets had zero mass, actually Jupiter has a mass which is one thousandth part of the mass of the sun, and that means that it, the gravitational field in the solar system is not generated entirely by the sun, and that makes all these three frequencies different from each other, but they're incredibly close to each other in the case of, a, of the solar system or a planetary system, whereas in a galaxy, they're quite significantly different. And another feature that's, that's, that's um, new, not new between um, the solar system and planets, but new between the quantum mechanical calculations we've been discussing and um, and these astro, astrophysical applications, the, these, the amplitudes of these oscillations are not small in the sense that in almost every oscillator, um, as you increase the amplitude, the frequency decreases or the period increases. This is totally generic feature of, of oscillators. Um, and in quantum mechanics, this doesn't somehow play a role, but in um, galactic dynamics, uh, it's of fundamental importance and introduces new physics. Now, our, our galaxy is a barred galaxy. The picture at top right is giving you a general idea of what a barred galaxy uh, looks like. Um, so there's an elongated distribution of stars at the center of the system. And this elongated distribution of stars, or the, the, this pattern of elongated distribution, rotates at a fairly steady rate. In the case of our own galactic bar, it, it seems to rotate at um, about 35 radians per, mega, per giga year, so 0 0.035 radians per mega year. And there are three, uh, as a result of this rotating bar, which of course creates a non-axisymmetric component to the gravitational potential, there are three um, very important characteristic radii. At the co-rotation radius, which is shown in the, at the bottom right, um, <clears throat> at the co-rotation radius, the bar, which is sort of symbolized by the dotted ellipse, rotates at the same rate that a star moving on a circular orbit in the underlying axisymmetrized potential would rotate. So typically stars uh, on the, on the co-rotation, um, at the co-rotation radius, Sort of hold their station with respect to the to the bar. They're either slightly ahead of the bar and stay ahead of the bar, or they're slightly behind the angular position of the bar and stay there, or they remain at the end of the bar if uh, if they start at the end of the bar. Um, and then there are two other radii that are important: the radii radii of the inner Lindblad radius and of the outer Lindblad radius. Um, at the inner Lindblad radius, stars because they're on sort of shorter circles, um, go around faster than the bar rotates. And at the inland blood radius, the um, stars overtake the bar so that they perceive, so, so they perceive the um, perturbing effect of the bar at their natural frequency of radial oscillations kappa. So the stars, um, on the inner limblet radius are moving around faster than the bar. Um, they therefore pass from one end of the bar where the bar's gravitational field is extra strong uh, to 
the other end of the bar um, and, and, and again feel it. So they're feeling this fluctuating force caused by the bar and at the, uh, at a, at, at the frequency uh, of their natural radial oscillations. At the outer limb of radius, by contrast, the stars are moving around less slowly than the bar. Uh, the bar overtakes them and gives them an inward uh, jolt every time its, uh, its sharp end is, one of its sharp ends is pointing at it. And these inward jolts uh, um, happen at a frequency uh, which coincides with the natural frequency kappa of their radial oscillations. So linear theory, if you now write down, if you now compute, um, now write down the equations of motion uh, for the, uh, of, these, of these stars by linearizing the equations of motion um, around the circular orbits in question, uh, the, you'll find that your equations predict divergent responses at the inner lad radius and the outer limb lad radius. So as you, 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 you get steady state solutions to the equations if you, uh, if you linearize the equations of motion about a radius r which is not either of these um, resonant radii. But if you look at your solution and examine how it behaves as the radius tends to the radius of one of the, of the either the ILR or the OLR, you'll find that the amplitude of the radial oscillations diverges. But of course, the, of course in the real world, the, um, you're not gonna get a divergent response, you're gonna get a finite response. And actually what happens is that the orbits become trapped by the resonances. And to, to understand what that means, I want now to talk about just the basic uh, pendulum. So here we have the absolute classic uh, basic pendulum also discussed in first year physics and even high school physics. So we have a bob uh, moving on a string of, of length r uh, and its angle with respect to the vertical is defined by, is, is going to be theta. And it's easy to figure out that the energy of this bob is a half m r theta dot squared minus, so that's the kinetic energy minus as MGR cos theta, which is, um, is the potential energy with a zero point set uh, at the fulcrum of the pendulum. So um, we've, we've all seen it shown that the small amplitude oscillations are harmonic. If we expand that, if we say theta is small with respect to a radian and expand that cos theta into um, one minus a half theta squared, then we have that the potential energy goes like theta squared, the kinetic energy goes like theta dot squared. And that means that the, uh, the, the equations of motion are those of a simple harmonic oscillator. So the motion is harmonic and the frequency is independent of amplitude as Galileo is supposed to have observed in a church. But um, in general, uh, when theta is not necessarily small, the frequency drops as the amplitude increases. And in fact, the period, the frequency goes to zero or the period goes to infinity as, as, the, as the maximum angle achieved goes to pi. So if you imagine as on the extreme right, the um, top right, if you imagine that the pendulum is swinging so far that it can get to top dead center, um, then its period goes to infinity because in principle, it could sit at top dead center forever and ever. That's a point of equilibrium. It's a point of unstable equilibrium, but it's still a point of equilibrium and it would therefore take an infinite amount of time to get out. Um, so the, the generic, to understand the dynamics of the pendulum, which is the classic nonlinear part, oscillator, um, the right thing to do is to do a plot, which is shown at the bottom right, of the angle of the pendulum versus its, its angular velocity d theta by dt, which is being plotted vertically. So if you imagine some of the, uh, um, the curves here um, in, the, in the middle, with, they're just ellipses, uh, or very closely approximated by ellipses, uh, and here, this is the harmonic 
regime, when it's an ellipse, the oscillator is being harmonic, um, you have that, uh, um, I've lost my cursor, dear, these things, uh, you, you have here that um, we have, um, we're passing through the point of equilibrium, so the, uh, um, the displacement is zero, but we have velocity, and then as we move around, um, as we move around to the right, because our velocity is positive, so our angle is increasing, our displacement increases and our velocity decreases, and then uh, our velocity becomes uh, negative, having passed through zero, the maximum amplitude, and so on and so forth. But then there's a critical trajectory uh, shown in red when the uh, we have just enough kinetic energy at the at the um, point of equilibrium that we that our amplitude takes us all the way to pi uh, theta is pi which is top dead center where we come to rest uh, i.e. I, theta dot goes to naught and we and and then later we fall back in and and go uh, to minus pi so and so on and so forth and this trajectory takes in principle an infinite amount of time. So our period is, is relatively, uh, relatively short here, longer on this one, much longer on this one, and essentially infinite there. But if you give the pendulum uh, enough kick that it can sail right over, so it, uh, you give it more kinetic energy at the bottom than it needs to get to the top, then it sails right it over uh, the top and then then it follows one of these trajectories these are circulating so it starts um, with large kinetic energy the kinetic energy decreases but even when it gets to the top it still has finite kinetic energy so it passes over the top theta is of course a periodic coordinate it reappears here and it so it circulates so we have a combination of oscillation near the point of uh, at low energies we have oscillation and at high energies we have circulation and we have a uh, yeah, and, and the period of the oscillations goes to infinity as circulate as oscillation goes over into circulation. So orbits, what happens, uh, I, I talked about the outer limb blood resonance, the inner limb blood resonance. Uh, well, this pendulum dynamics is exactly what happens. So the plot at top right is showing uh, the radius at which the star in a, a potential like that of the galaxy on, uh, uh, um, moves through the galactic plane, um, passing uh, upwards. Uh, and so that, that radius is being plotted against the velocity, uh, the radial velocity, uh, velocity in the radial direction at that point. So this is, a, this is basically, uh, um, particle which is moving in two dimensions it's moving I showed that pincushion diagram it's moving on an orbit in the RZ plane or we can reduce the motion to, to motion in the RZ plane so it's not a one-dimensional oscillation which is what we had with the pendulum so we can't you we, we have to be a little bit uh, subtle about how to how to analyze this and the, the standard method of analyzing this that was introduced by Henri Poincaré at the beginning of the last century is that you plot one coordinate against the corresponding momentum. So you plot R versus VR when, when, when another coordinate, in this case Z, is nothing. And so what you see in this diagram is, uh, is two sets of curves. There are red curves and there are blue curves. And then you also see dots. The dots represent the uh, show the actual values of R and VR, which are obtained by numerically integrating um, some orbits. And you can see that they're very closely approximate. They, they, they tend to fall on the red curves, um, corresponding red curves, which are being commute, computed um, by a very different apparatus that I haven't got time to go into now, called torus mapping. Uh, and it's evident that the red curves uh, provide pretty good fits to the numerically integrated orbits. And the blue curves are what you would see um, if there was, if there was uh, conservation of angular momentum. So if you didn't, so um, if, if, you, if you didn't have um, 
uh, any kind of, if you didn't have a bar, the points would lie on the blue curves. And you can see they don't remotely lie on the blue curves. Um, they lie on the red curves, which are computed um, taking into account that there is a bar. And you, whereas uh, on, on a blue curve, the, the point, if you took the bar away, the particles, um, if I can, oh dear, sorry, back to that. Um, if, if you was in these particles here, which are very trapped, they, uh, um, on a blue curve, these particles would go all the way around here, um, but actually they just piddle around there. So what this means is that the, the star is coordinating its oscillations um, uh, it, it, it's coordinating its oscillations with the bar when it's trapped and nearly all of these nearly all of these orbits are in fact trapped the only one the numer only numerical orbit that is not trapped is this one here and can you see you see the red curves are, 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 are have a certain similarity with with these all these black curves here um, uh, in that they they're coming around to meet each other. So this is circulation inside, inside here and outside here there's circulation and this is the trapping zone. Uh, and in the trap zone, the, there is coordination between the uh, radial oscillations of the star and the bar. And in real space that manifests itself as this pattern at the bottom where you can see that the stars are making their points of closest approach to the galactic center along the minor axis of the bar and having that tended to be at their largest distance from the galactic center uh, along the long axis of the bar. So they are contributing to the gravitational field of the bar. This is what happens with the inner limb blood resonance, which is a good deal more complicated because the effect of the bar is much stronger at inner limb blood resonance, but qualitatively the same thing is happening. Um, uh, I think because time is short, I won't I won't dwell on that diagram. But carotation, uh, things are somewhat uh, they're similar but different. Uh, but there's very important physics associated with what's happening. So uh, the picture up here is is showing the top right is showing the angle theta uh, uh, horizontally uh, and radius vertically. So this is a kind of, this is, this is what you would get by taking an annulus in the galaxy and unwrapping it. Um, imagine that, that this star thing is the, is, the, is the bottom of the potential well of the bar. So a star here, which is at smaller radius and overtaking the bar, um, uh, yeah, the, these, these particles move along here towards the, the end of the bar and as they do they're pulled by the bar and their angular momentum is increased. When the, if you increase the angular momentum of a star it tends to move outwards. So these particles uh, um, start with less angular momentum than the bar. They're given angular momentum by the bar because they are pulled towards the bottom of the gravitational potential well of the bar and then they uh, move outwards. And because they move outwards, they start, even though they've now got more angular momentum, they start to fall behind the bar. So a star which uh, starts uh, with, um, a star which starts with uh, less angular momentum than the bar finishes after being pulled by the bar with more angular momentum and falling behind the bar. And then when it gets to the other side, it, it, um, it, uh, it's now pulled uh, backwards by the bar, which reduces its angular momentum and it falls inwards. So you see these, 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 these stars are circulating. They're too far from the co-rotation radius for, for any trapping to occur. But these stars become trapped by the bar. When you look at the galaxy from on top, the bar lies uh, in this bottom picture, the, the, the bar lies horizontally and the orbits of the of stars which are trapped at co-rotation look like this. They're this kind of the, this kind of shape, um, and uh, um, um, so this star is moving from this small radius to this large radius. Here it has less angular momentum. Here it has more angular momentum. Uh, 
uh, and on the other side of the galactic center, um, the same thing is happening to another star. So, um, so because at Kero, near rotation, it takes a long time for a star to approach the, uh, the bottom of the bar, the transfer of angular momentum uh, happens in the same sense over a long period of time, and that causes significant changes in the orbit of the star. Stars we can see can shift from radii which are smaller than the galactic center to star to radii which are larger than the, um, um, than the co-rotation radius. And, and in the process, they reverse their drift with respect to the bar. These are orbits which are trapped by the, the co-rotation. So this manifests itself um, by in the chemistry of the galactic disk. So um, spiral patterns, as well as bars, come and go. They, so let's think about this, the same physics would happen associated with a spiral uh, shaped gravitational disturbance. And these things, they grow and then they fade. When the, uh, as the, as the um, pattern grows, a star can become trapped um, by the co-rotation resonance um, and start to change its and make start to make have significant changes in its radius and the radius that we, and then as the as the pattern fades it will be released but in the middle time its radius while it was trapped changes significantly and so we have a we have a mechanism here for shuffling the radii shuffling the disk by moving the radii of stars now in the interstellar medium the abundances of carbon oxygen magnesium iron etc the heavy elements decrease as you move outward because the gas in the middle of the galaxy has been affected by more dying stars than the gas in the outer part of the galaxy. So there's an, an abundance gradient of heavy elements uh, decreasing outwards. Um, so the metal rich stars have to have been born from the insular medium at small radii, but you find them further out. So the diagram at the bottom shows um, the black curve, shows the distribution with respect to uh, metallicity. So this is this on the bottom, the bottom, the bottom is the logarithm of, an, of the abundance of iron, basically. Um, and the vertical histogram is, is the number density. So that you can see that the black curve is showing uh, uh, and, and zero on this scale is the is the abundance of iron in the sun. So you can see that, and this is a sample of stars fairly close to the sun, within a few kiloparsecs of the sun. And what you see is that there um, are quite a lot of stars which are more metal rich than the sun. Um, and what you also see is the corresponding diagram in yellow of the distribution of um, open clusters. So these are relatively young objects formed from the interstellar medium in the same kind of region of space that the stars are formed. And you can see that that distribution cuts off at abundances of something like 0.2, whereas the distribution of stars continues on up to at least 0.3. So the point here is that the, there, there are stars, there are more metal rich stars than there, of, than there are metal rich young stars. And this, this is a manifestation of this shuffling that stars that were born uh, relatively close to the galactic center but through the shuffling process have migrated outwards uh, and the open clusters haven't been around long enough to have done much of this migration. So they're not showing the same effect. The sun in fact is thought to have migrated out in this way by about two kiloparsecs, which is quite significant given that it lives now at 8.27 kiloparsecs. Time is, is very short, um, sorry. And so I think I might, I might skip this about waves. So I'll just make the basic point that I've been talking about stars as three-dimensional oscillators and they are three-dimensional oscillators, but they're also, they also attract each other. That means that they're oscillators which are coupled to each other. Individually, they attract each other very weakly, which means they're very weakly coupled oscillators. Now, if you take a series of pendulum bobs, like Newton's uh, balls, 
and uh, uh, then they all they're all swing independently. But if you put springs between those bobs, then you have a system that supports waves. And the 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 point about a galactic disk is it contains these three dimensional oscillators which are weakly coupled to each other by their mutual gravity, and that that means that they support waves. Um, there are wave motions which are confined to the plane. So if you, it, which just involve excitation of the of the radial oscillations, and that's largely what we've been talking about. And then there are oscillations which also involve or, uh, the the vertical oscillations in the vertical direction. Uh, and so so when we were talking about quantum mechanics, we had an electromagnetic wave. Uh, interacting with a with an oscillator, an atom, which is an oscillator. So in the galaxy, you have these you have gravitational waves. That's that's waves in the density of stars in the disk, uh, which interact with the resonant oscillators, which are the which are the particles. And one of the unexpected, uh, probably it shouldn't have been unexpected, discoveries of the Gaia satellite, which was launched in 2013 and produced its first important data in 2018, was of coupled oscillations in the uh, vertical and in-plane direction. So the pictures on the right show the Z VZ plane. So these are these are this is showing the dense, this is showing stars um, actually measured near the sun, uh, their VZ motion is being plotted and their Z motion is being plotted. Um, and the pixels, each pixel in this diagram contains many stars because uh, uh, Gaia for this purpose is measured several million stars. Um, and what's being shown, the color of the pixel is being given by either at the top, the, um, uh, um, the V phi, the velocity of the star going around the galactic center. So it's been colored by the mean value of that in a pixel. And in the bottom by the VR, the, the component of velocity towards the galactic center. And what you see in both diagrams is spiral. And this is a signature of a, of a, of a wave, which is, involves both in-plane motion and motion perpendicular to the galactic plane, a dynamics of which is not yet properly understood. Now, Resonances are also a really important source of chaos. Um, in ordinary kinetic theory of gases, you think of the chaos as being generated by the collisions of one atom on another atom, which you imagine to happening a bit like hard billiard balls. Um, but in a plasma or in a galaxy, you don't get these collisions, but uh, and so you don't have the source of entropy generation the collisions can't generate entropy in the way that they do uh, in a gas, but but resonances uh, can cause chaos um, by first trapping and then releasing uh, from the entrapment, the way I've described um, in the co-rotation case. Uh, um, so 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 um, and this. This chaos manifests itself in, chaos always manifests itself in extreme sensitivity um, to initial conditions. Uh, sorry, this is somehow got lost. Um, okay, so, and it, and it turns out that trajectories of, so I'm now gonna shift the ground to talk about um, planetary system dynamics, specifically the dynamics of the solar system. So, uh, the, the distance between possible trajectories of the solar system grows um, by a factor of 10 with every 10 mega years that you integrate. So from about the middle, from about the middle 1980s, it became possible to numerically integrate the equations of motion of the planets in the solar system, taking, proper, taking into account properly the gravitational fields generated by the individual planets. And, that's, and then you found that the outcome of an integration uh, was incredibly sensitive to the initial conditions uh, that you gave. And in fact, so that's what I'm talking about, the, the, the distance between trajectories which start incredibly close increases exponentially over time and it grows by a factor of 10 if you, uh, when you, length, every, every 10 mega years that you continue the integration. Um, 
So, so in, to give to make be, to be concrete about that, um, if you want to make predictions for what the positions of the planets is going to be 60 mega years from now, you need initial conditions which are a thousand times more precise than to predict uh, the initial conditions a mere 30 mega years away. Because of this incredible sensitivity to the initial condition, we will never be able to predict the position of the planets more than about 50 mega years into the future. It's just simply never going to be possible because we will never get the the initial conditions will never be able to measure the, 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 the positions of the planets and the asteroids and whatnot sufficiently accurately to do that. So we have a given that the solar system is on the order of five giga years old, 50 mega years is frankly, it's only 1% or so of the age of the system. It's only 1% or so of the future of the system. There's a fundamental problem here. We will never be able to predict how things go. Um, but what and the reason that this is that we have this great sensitivity is is precisely these resonances. The pictures on the right um, are from a, a pioneering study by Jack Wisdom of the effect of resonances on dynamics. And I see time is up. Um, what you see is sudden changes. You see things pottering along in some range. This is eccentricity plotted versus time. And then suddenly it shifts to something else. Then it shifts to something else. Then it shifts to something else. This is as resonances lock in and, and unlock uh, an endless succession of, of that kind of thing. So in 2009, a couple of French colleagues numerically integrated the equations of motion from the solar system for through its future. So five gig, five gig years, they sampled two and a half thousand initial conditions and they found that in 1% of the trajectories, Mercury's electricity became large enough to allow collision with another planet. And in one solution, Jupiter goes rogue and destroys, ejects the inner planets. And these and this these bad outcomes all arise from a resonance between Jupiter and Mercury. Um, so these trajectories that Lescar and Gastineau uh, used Einstein's proper complete theory of gravity. They also integrated a mere 201 trajectories using Newton's theory. So leaving out the general relativistic, general relativistic corrections, which are only parts in 10 to the eighth. So incredibly small changes to the equations of motion because the planets move a lot slower than the speed of light. But it, with Newton's theory, um, a half of trajectories had Mercury's eccentricity exceeding 0.9. 34 trajectories out of 200 uh, Mercury falls into the sun. In 86 trajectories, Mercury collides with Venus. Only one integration reached five gig years without the planets colliding. Well, the solar system has already lived for nearly five gig years um, because Newton's equations of motion are, are not correct and Einstein's equations of motion are, are correct. And Einstein's corrections detune this dangerous resonance with Jupiter, between Jupiter and Mercury. So, I think that's an interesting story. Okay, time is up. Here are my conclusions. On the right, a small advertisement um, for a very short introduction to astrophysics in case you uh, have enjoyed what I've said today. There's a lot more um, along the same lines in there. Thanks. Do I unstop sharing screen? Thanks a lot for the talk. That was very interesting. Um, we should wait. If anyone has questions, raise your hand. They raise a hand or put them in the chat. It'd be helpful if you just kept the conclusion slides up so people have something. Oh, right, you'd like to have this back. Um, so share yeah, screen. Just the, there we go. Yeah, just yeah. the conclusion. I, I was worried that. Um, you got it? Yes, perfect. Okay, so someone's raised their hand. Someone's um, raised their hand. So Alex, um, do you want to turn on your video and your mic and you can ask a question? Uh, yeah, sure, thanks. Um, I just wanted to um, ask, I noticed that there wasn't very much mention of, um, of dark matter in there. And given that, um, you know, that's quite a big impact on uh, radial velocities and things like that, how, uh, to what extent has that been factored in with all of with all of this? 
And would that affect the resonances at all? Oh, absolutely. Well, OK, so the gravitational field of dark matter you sort of put in um, and at this level, you're just putting it in as a fixed uh, commodity. Uh, well, you're finding a model. So what I've been talking about is in the context of a model galaxy in which dark matter is fully taken into account. It's 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 gravitational field is determined, you know, by integrating, as it were, its equations of motion and so on and so forth. But what I what I have not been including uh, is the is so so we can treat the dark matter as a sort of fluid, right? We we think it consists of particles of a GV or something anyway, incredibly small compared to that of a mass of a star. So it's essentially a continuum. Um, and when discussing the oscillations, you just treat this continuum as as a fixed thing. Actually, it will respond itself to the gravitational, to the waves in the disk, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that is something which people don't yet do um, much. They do it, so that is being taken into account a little bit, for example, in that it causes slowing of the bar. So a topic I thought I, I considered you know, including and haven't included, which I think is actually quite, ex I considered including because I think it's exciting. I haven't included it because there wasn't going to be time, um, what is that as the bar slows, so the bar is, made, is largely made up of stars, it um, is dragged, it's, as it rotates, it transfers angular momentum to the dark matter. The dark matter, as it loses angular momentum, its angular frequency goes down, and this causes the resonances that I've been talking about to migrate outwards. And this outward migration has probably been detected in the in the distribution of through this migration process that I've I was talking about. It's probably been detected in the distribution of metallicity amongst stars which are trapped by the bar. But that's the only case, as far as I know, where where the dragging effect, where the the, the response of the dark matter to the oscillations, to the waves has so far been taken into account. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, so there was one uh, question in the chat and um, it just says, uh, I want to ask how is the galactic bar formed? If I missed that bit, I'm sorry. No, I, I didn't talk about that. The, um, how is the galactic bar formed? Well. Um, in the, big, the, the the standard theory of galaxy formation is that um, essentially the galaxy assembles as a dark matter structure, dark matter only structure. The, the thing we've learned from simulations of galaxy formation over the last 15 years or so is that feedback from star formation. So the stars started to form, I don't know, a redshift of, of 16, something like that. And Early on, very massive stars formed. These massive stars explode very quickly, almost instantaneously, heat the, heat the baryons and drive them out of the gravitational potential wells, which at that time are relatively shallow. So the galaxy formation proceeds largely by the clustering of the dark matter on its own. And, the, and galaxies form uh, later on, or largely through the infall of, um, of gas. So our own galactic disk uh, has formed from the steady infall of, of gas from the enormous reservoir of gas, which is still out there. Most of the baryons in the universe are still in the intergalactic medium out there somewhere. And as so they form on these relatively circular orbits and spiral structure as, as the disk gradually becomes more and more self-gravitating, its mass becomes more and more significant relative to the, to the mass of the dark matter inside it. Um, sp spirals develop the sp and, the, and the spirals degenerate into a bar by processes which are broadly speaking understood um, but complicated. So I don't think I, I it would take a, at least a lecture to, to explain um, about the origin of spiral structure and why that tends to go into a bar. But anyway, that is what happens. And then you, which you uh, it's very strongly confirmed by end-body simulations. 
And then the bar at some point when it's sufficiently strong ceases to be an in-plane thing, bar buckles. It, it, it uh, develops motion perpendicular to the galactic plane. And that's how the bulge, the bulge of our galaxy has, and many other galaxies, have extremely clear signatures that, that this is what happened. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we are running out of time. So um, if anyone um, has any final questions, um, yeah. yeah, this is your chance. I mean, if not, we can just conclude um, here and if everyone's happy with that. Thanks for the invitation. Okay, thank you very much for coming to thank the talk for um, Fast right. Sai. Um, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, Have a good day of physics and um, biology. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Also, um, the audience, we're going to be starting our student speaker session in about 15 minutes. Um, the Zoom links are in the email that you must have gotten, and um, we hope to see you there too. I think we can stop streaming on YouTube now. <laughs>